Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Jennifer Nyman. I'm with Geosyntec Consultants. We are the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESCCP. Today's webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERTIP and ESCCP, followed by two technical presentations. They will cover DOD-funded research efforts to evaluate the state, transport, and treatment of munitions constituents in soil and groundwater. First, Dr. Dominique DiToro of the University of Delaware will discuss models using quantum chemical computations to estimate the partition coefficients for munitions constituents between groundwater and interacting soil and biotic phases. His presentation will be followed by a brief question and answer session. Then, Dr. Neil Bruce from the University of York will discuss efforts to successfully engineer transgenic plants capable of remediating toxic explosives pollutants. Neil's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a Q&A session featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you haven't done so already, download Zoom at the link shown here. If you cannot download Zoom, you may view the slides using a compatible internet browser like Firefox, IE, or Edge by creating a free Zoom account. If you still can't view the slides or if your screen freezes, you can try keying Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you have audio issues and you're accessing the audio through your computer, you can click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, call into the conference line shown here. You can also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box, though, only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A box should be reserved for questions for the speakers. And in case of continued technical difficulties, you can download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration email. We will also be live streaming the webinar on the CERTIP and ESGCP YouTube channel at the link shown here. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box that is on your screen. You don't have to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions, and we encourage you to submit them in advance of that session. When you submit your questions, please do add your organizational name at the end of your question. And with that, I would like to introduce Cara Patton, an Environmental Project Manager at Noblis, and the Technical Assistant for the Environmental Restoration Program Area under CERTIP and ESTCP. Ms. Patton has worked with CERTIP and ESTCP since 2008 under the Environmental Restoration and Resource Conservation and Resiliency Program areas. Prior to that, she worked at the Drug Enforcement Administration, where she was a forensic chemist. Ms. Patton received her BS and MS in Chemistry from George Mason University. Cara, please proceed. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. First, I want to give you a brief overview of who we are. CERTIP and NIAS TCP are two companion programs. The Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, or CERTIP, is a partnership between the Department of Defense, the EPA, and the Department of Energy and is a science and technology program. We have been around since 1991, and our goal is to develop research from fundamental to more applied so that we can create the knowledge and technologies to impact real world environmental management. CERTIP operates if you, in companionship with ESTCP, or the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program and is a demonstration validation program operated out of the Department of Defense. It's designed to take research, knowledge, and technologies developed under CERTIP and other research programs and demonstrate them in the field with the ultimate goal being the technology transfer of these technologies to accelerate their broader application and commercialization. Research is guided by a few environmental drivers. The first being sustaining our testing and training ranges, facilities, and operations. 
As you can imagine, this is a very broad and covers a range of environmental drivers in itself, such as threatened and endangered species, noise issues, and UXO and munitions constituents. We are also looking to reduce current and future liability, which is also quite broad and can take the form of pollution prevention to eliminate hazardous materials or processes at our military installations and issues from past practices where we have had impacted groundwater, soils and sediments and some emerging chem chemical issues. It is very important for us to transfer the information being developed under CERTA BINIAS TCP. And we have a number of ways that we do this through in-person trainings, videos, guidance, and ultimately where we are today, our webinars. We are always trying to get this information out to people that are interested in and will use the information. Shown here is a list of some future webinars. We have a few munitions related webinars in the next few months. Registration for these webinars are live at the link shown here on this, web, on this page and in the webinar chat. You can also access archived webinars at this link as well. Jennifer, I'll turn things back over to you to introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you so much, Cora. Now, my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dominique De Toro, the Edward C. Davis Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Delaware. In a parallel professional career, he also served as Senior Research Consulting Engineer at Hydro Science and as principal consultant and partner at HydroQual. His major areas of research have been in building models. Dr. DeToro's current research projects focus on PFAS partitioning models and multiple modes of action toxicity models. His awards include the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry Founders Award and the Institute of Scientific Information Highly Cited Researcher for Ecology and Environment was also elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Dr. DeToro earned his master's degree in electrical engineering and his doctoral degree in civil and geological engineering from Princeton University. Dom, please go ahead with today's first technical presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's presentation, I'd like to uh, present to you a model that we've developed for predicting partition coefficients uh, that are required in pretty much every faint transport and in fact remediation model where it's required to determine the, uh, the distribution of materials in various environmental phases. So the presentation will start with a choice of the method that we, why we chose the method that, that I'll speak to you about, how it works, what the technical approach looks like, give you a look at representative results, how well it works, and then end with some conclusions. And finally, a brief discussion of, of why you might want to pursue this particular avenue for making estimations. Consider the following situation, which is pretty much characteristic of a risk assessment scenario for a munitions constituents. Now let's imagine that you're interested in in uh, dealing with R RDX, and you'd like to make predictions of its partitioning between the contaminated soil, let's say, and all of the other environmental phases that interact with it. So for example, soil microorganisms are directly contacting the soil. Uh, soil water, groundwater interactions will provide concentrations of the material in groundwater. Groundwater and surface water interactions will uh, a concentration of the material in surface water. And from those three exposures, you'd like to be able to predict what's going on in the plants that are exposed to the soil water and aquatic organisms that are exposed to the surface water, benthic organisms that are exposed to the sediments and soil invertebrates that are exposed directly to, to the soil. For a compound like RDX, there's been quite a lot of experimental uh, investigations that have established what of the, what of the, um, sorry, I'm getting a message. Um, I have got the, uh, is the volume better at this point? 
So the trick is to, Beverly, is there a problem? Uh, Dom, you're coming through just fine. Okay, sorry. Okay, so what we'd like to do is for RDX, we have experimental information, but what about another compound? For example, the first degradation product of RDX. Uh, is there a way that we can estimate the partition coefficients that we need among all of the, among all of the environmental phases? So how does one choose an estimation method? This problem's been around for quite a long time. So this is not a new issue. Um, the risk assessments that the Department of Defense does and everyone else does pretty much require partition coefficients. So what we'd like to choose an estimation method that has demonstrated predictive ability. We'd like it to be based on the appropriate chemical properties that directly influence partitioning. In other words, we'd like the thing to be developed using the chemical understanding of what's going on. Uh, this is quite different than some of the methods that are currently being used, which basically rely on rather elaborate regression analyses without a direct focus on what really is, is happening in terms of the chemical properties. And you'll see what I mean when, you, when we show you what the, the method looks like. And we would like, by the way, to have descriptors that can be experimentally obtained if possible so that we can check at least that uh, the estimates that we're making using the methods we're going to uh, propose are, are operating sensibly. And finally, we'd like a method where if the, if the estimation is failing, we have some idea what's going on. We have a, we have a way of, of investigating what is causing that failure. And one of the major impediments for using black box type estimation methods is that you have no idea why it's failing. Worse, you probably have no idea why it's working, neither of which is a sensible way to operate in my opinion. So the choice of partitioning model we adopted is the so-called Abraham partition coefficient PP leafer model, which is a mouthful. Michael Abraham uh, developed this many years ago, actually. It's quite old and it's been used quite a lot in, by various groups of people. And it's set up as follows. The partition coefficient equation, think for the, initially it dealt with the partitioning between solvents and water. So think octanol water partition coefficient. And it is the ratio of the concentration of the RDX, let's say, in the solvent, octanol, uh, over the concentration of the munition constituents, again, RDX in water. So the Abraham model is set up this way. The log of the partition coefficient is equal to a series of six terms, which are additive in the equation. And the reason that it's called um, a PFP leafer is that it's a polyparameter method, which means there are six terms linearly, and that the, the terms actually have direct chemical meaning. I remind you that the log of a partition coefficient is proportional to the Gibbs free energy of the reaction, of the reaction free energy. And at equilibrium, that reaction free energy is zero. And so you'd like to calculate what is the, the delta G. And that is the, the way Abraham set this up is that each of the terms in the equation is a contribution of that particular chemical interaction between the solvent and water. Uh, and in particular, I, on the next slide, I will show you what they mean, but just to get some of the nomenclature clear, initially this was all solvent water partitioning, octanol water, hexadecane water, and so on. And so the nomenclature has persisted. Uh, when you hear me say solvent, think uh, soil organic carbon or organic organism lipid or so on. And when you hear me say system, think either a solvent and water, octanol water, for example, or soil organic carbon water. Okay, so the partition coefficient is the ratio of the concentration of the chemical in organic carbon, let's say, divided by the concentration in water. So how does this work? The terms in the model, 
express direct chemical interactions that contribute to the reaction free energy of the, uh, the Gibbs free energy of the reaction. Uh, the first quantifies molecular polarizability. The uppercase letters, clear about that, the uppercase letters are the parameters that are associated with the solute RDX. The system parameters, the lowercase letters, are associated with the system that you're dealing with. Think octanol water or soil organic carbon water. How we get both of these parameter sets, I'll discuss in a minute, but I'd like first to discuss what it is that they are modeling. So the product, lowercase letters, which are the system parameters, and the uppercase letter, which is the solute parameter, is modeling molecular polarizability. Basically, the idea is that if I have a molecule and it comes up against another molecule that has, and of course, the electron distribution generates an electric field, and you get interactions between the, the electric fields, the solute will polarize, and that polarization causes an attraction. And that attraction is the effect of molecular polarizability. That is effectively the Van der Waals interaction that occurs. It's the weakest of the interactions that, that one deals with. The next one is the interaction having to do with the formation of a cavity. When you take a, a, a compound, for example, RDX, and take it from octanol into water, you have to, you have to generate a cavity in water that's, that's large enough to hold the molecule. Water is a highly structured solvent. It's pretty close to a solid. The freezing point is not that far away from uh, laboratory temperature. And as a consequence, it's high, strongly hydrogen bonded. It takes a lot of energy to punch a hole in water. And as a consequence, the volume term dominates the so-called hydrophobic effect. The next three are, are associated with other interactions. The dipole induced dipole interaction, most molecules have a permanent dipole. And if you take a permanent dipole and put it up against the molecule of the solvent that, that can deform, you generate again an interaction. And that dipole induced dipole interaction causes an attraction. And finally, the two most, not most important, but certainly in many cases important, are the hydrogen bonding terms. A water is both a strong hydrogen bond donor and acceptor. And the solute, if it can donate a hydrogen bond, so for example, phenol, the hydrogen on the OH, can donate a hydrogen bond and bond with the oxygen in water and form a relatively strong hydrogen bond. On the other hand, if the, if the uh, solute RDX has strong hydrogen bond accepting capabilities, uh, partially negative atoms, the nitrogen groups, for example, then the, the uh, solvent will interact with that and you will get a hydrogen bond accepting. So notice the way the model is put together. Each of the terms in the model, they're not some un, unusual or not understandable uh, term in a, in a regression, the kinds of things that you see in, in uh, machine learning. These things are direct chemical interactions which are understood. Okay, so how do I get the numbers to actually do this? The system parameters actually were the beginnings of this whole, um, this entire model, which were not developed by Michael Abraham initially, but his mentor, Mortimer Camlet, who actually worked at the United States Naval Academy. Um, and he, he was interested in trying to figure out how solvents affect spectral shifts of various chemicals and came up with a system, what are now the system parameters. So these things pre-existed the, um, the solute parameters. And Michael Abraham had the idea of trying out the same thing using the system parameters as, as characteristics of the solvent water system and then generating solute parameters for now the compounds of interest. So for example, RDX. And his idea was as follows. If we know the lowercase parameters, then these are a linear, you can solve for the, the solute parameters, the uppercase letters, by a linear regression. So here's how he did it. He said, actually it was some other workers that finally established the, the current method. But anyway, you, you, you experimentally measure the 
partition coefficient between RDX and five solvents, octanol, uh, cyclohexane, and so on. That gives you five data points. You estimate the index of refraction of RDX. And that's difficult because this initially started off with solutes that were liquids. And of course, you could figure out what the uh, index of refraction is for octanol, for example. Uh, so they have a method that is basically a fragment method to, to make that estimate. It's not very satisfactory, but anyway, that's how it's done. The cavity volume of the molecule is easy. There's a technique called, uh, a method called the McGowan volume, which is basically um, an atom and bond uh, formulation, which is very simple to apply and actually works very well. It's very close to, to the more modern method that we use. And so you have then generated the following information. You've got measured uh, octanol water partition coefficients, for example, or organic carbon water partition coefficients. You've estimated the polarizability. You've estimated the, the volume, you know, the constant. You bring the knowns to the left-hand side of the equation, and now you have a regression analysis in the dipole-induced dipole and hydrogen bonding solute terms. Three unknowns, five equations. It's a simple regression, and the answer falls out. Um, our idea was to replace experimental sol solvent water partition coefficients with quantum chemically calculated solvent water partition coefficients. Modern quantum chemical methods have relatively reliable solvent water modeling capabilities, but the primary difficulty is that they're not very accurate. Quantum chemistry can make estimates of many things, but the accuracy is nowhere near the accuracy of experimental determinations. So our idea was instead of having five data points, let us calculate 53 data points. Let us calculate the solvent water partition coefficient for RDX in 53 solvents. And those solvents were, were chosen because we know what system parameters are available, lots of them for the solvents. And we also know uh, we have to match that with the solvents that the quantum chemical methods can, can calculate. And the current method that we use are based on, on the Gaussian, which is the industry standard uh, quantum chemistry program. And they have roughly 50 solvents where that match is made. The only other important contribution was to calculate the uppercase E from molecular uh, the index of refraction, to calculate it directly from a quantum chemical calculation of molecular polarizability. That is a standard calculation, and there's an equation that, that relates uh, molecular polarizability to the index of refraction. And that's, that then solves the problem of how do you get the index of refraction for a solid. Basically, you just calculate the molecular polarizability in the gas phase and apply the formula. The rest is exactly what uh, follows how the experimental technique works. So now you have a regression analysis. You have not five solvent water partition coefficients, 53, and you're estimating three parameters. And that's how we do it. So that is the, the, the method, the quantum chemical method that we use for Abraham, estimating Abraham partition coefficients. Um, this model has been around a long time. And as a consequence, there is quite a lot of information that's available uh, from a database that's called the, that was called, this still is called the UFZ database, and it's at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig. Uh, the website is at the bottom of the slide. And if you, if you do a global download, which you can do of all the solute parameters that are there, there are essentially 1,200, uh, 12,000 uh, parameters that are available of which 7,000 roughly are the ESABVs, the parameters that, that we use, uh, where the volume term is, is one of the, the cavity volume term is one of the parameters. If you ask yourself how many unique chemicals there are, there are about 2,300 unique compounds for which there are solute parameters. Now, not all of these are experimental measurements. A lot of these are determined by, by estimation techniques. And if, you, if you're curious about what's there in terms of, 
molecular properties, about half of them actually can donate hydrogen bonds. So that's interesting. On the system parameter side, which is really what you care about, because the only reason you want Abraham parameters is to join them up with the system parameters for a particular system that you're interested in. So there are about, two, uh, about 120, 130 solvent water partition coefficients, of which octanol, of course, is one of them. There are solvent air partition coefficient, octanol air. There are surfaces. There are sorbents of various types. There is organic carbon. There are aerosols. There is a lipid water partition coefficient. And all of them are designed to work in parallel with the solute parameters. So if you have a solute parameter set, you can then calculate the partition coefficient for any one of these systems. That's the power of the method that once you've spent the effort to get the Abraham solute parameters for RDX, you can calculate what is the partition coefficient of RDX with all of these solvents and systems. Well, how well does it work? The, we, for for, the, for this, the CERTA project that where we developed this initially, we made some measurements of the uh, partition coefficients of some uh, MCs, in particular RDX and its friends, HMX and a few others, 4NAN. And we compared the predicted versus the observed solvent water partition coefficients for the solvents listed on the left-hand side of the, of the figure and the solutes on the right-hand side. The blue dots are Absolve predictions. Absolve makes predictions using functional decomposition it just takes apart the molecule. It says, well, I have a benzene ring. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, functional group is a methoxy group that adds so much energy. Uh, there's a nitro group at another position that adds so much energy and so on. So it doesn't, it just uses essentially the configuration. And you can see that for some of the compounds, uh, it, it does about as well as the quantum chemical method does, which is estimate the partitioning in 53 solvents and so on. But when you get to RDX and its friends, suddenly it just falls apart dramatically. And the reason is that it is built on fragments that have been established from experimental data. And it turns out that Absolve doesn't know about the NN group between the heterocycle and the nitro group. But it doesn't bother to tell you that it doesn't know that. It just gives you wrong answers. So that's very disturbing. Um, and the problem with it is that it's a black box. A number comes out and that's it. So, so it looks like the quantum chemical methods are okay. Um, I remind you that we don't use any experimental data to generate the Abraham parameters for molecules. We just use the molecular structure and quantum chemical calculation. So how well does it go? Um, here's an example of the prediction of uh, the optimal water partition coefficients for these munition constituents. What's plotted here is on the y-axis is the fitted versus observed log KOW from which the system parameters were obtained. So of course, this just shows that the, the system can reproduce the numbers that you use to get the, to get the system parameters. Of course, you have to have the solute parameters as well. So what we did was just take the solute parameters that we calculated for, for the munition constituents and just make a flat out prediction. That's the colored dots. I remind you that the, that the system parameters have never seen um, munition constituents. So this is a flat out prediction. You can see that the root mean square is typically about 0.5, is 0.5 for all of the unfilled circle. That's all the data that was used to set the system parameters. When we ask how well it predicts the munition constituents, it gets a root mean square of about 0.4. That, this is, these are typical ranges of the accuracies. It's the same situation for log KOC, same thing. The unfilled circles are, are uh, the, fit, the, the data used to get the system parameters, the colored uh, data are predicted. Here, it, it, it did remarkably well, almost too well. Here's a, a more stringent test. I'd like to predict the plant concentration. These were grasses that, that we grew in the CERTA project. I'd like to predict the concentration in the plant 
from the soil concentration that was measured. So soil to plant. In order to do that, you need a partition coefficient between the soil and water, and then you need a partition coefficient between the plant water and the plant cuticle. These system parameters were gotten from, uh, in one case, published data that was done by Platt and Abraham, and in the second, the KOC model that I just presented, and here's the equation. And you can see, this is the observed plant concentration, and this is the predicted plant concentration. Now, none of these systems have ever seen munitions constituents. And here's the compounds that we had data for. Uh, this, the unfilled circles, by the way, those horizontal lines are a data set that, we, that were in the literature where the exposure has exceeded the solubility of the compound. And so what we do in that case is we just use the, the uh, calculated solubility as, as the predicted water concentration, and that's why they're constant. Again, you can see within all the lines, by the way, are order of magnitude differences. You can see that we can do a reasonable job. Finally, uh, here's the same thing for worms. We did a prediction for the bioconcentration of Asinia, an earthworm, in contaminated set of soils. And the way we did it was using partition coefficient from a fish bioconcentration model. So it had never seen any of the, any of the uh, ammunition constituents, and we get about the same kind of, kind of behavior. So I think you can see that that if you need to calculate what's going to happen to a degradation product, what you simply, simply, what you need to do is to calculate the Abraham parameters for the molecular structure. Once you have this, the solute Abraham parameters, you've got it for all of the other phases in which you have to make predictions. So it, it is a very efficient method once you know how to do the, the, the prediction. So to conclude, I think you can see that it successfully predicts uh, partition coefficients. It more importantly successfully predicts the concentration in the, in the end targets in the plants or in the worms, and it predicts it from soil exposure, which is exactly what you need to do uh, in any kind of risk assessment. Of course, you need 53 roughly solvent water quantum chemical estimates of uh, water, solvent water partitioning. That's the difficult part. And it clearly uh, is better than absolved because these functional decomposition methods can make, can make um, errors and you just don't know why they're breaking. So finally, if you're gonna do risk assessments, you've gotta have partition coefficients. And the Abraham method using quantum chemical calculations is very efficient because once you've got it for a new mission constituents, you're there. You can make the calculations for any of the uh, partitioning systems that you have constants for. Uh, a couple of, of difficulties, the methodology is not yet available for anionic munition constituents, for example, NTO, and the currently um, being investigated, the fluorinated materials. Um, we can discuss where that is and, and what's going on. And finally, you should understand that, that this is not a universal tool. It, it'll only make a reasonable estimate for interactions that are describable by the five molecular mechanisms that it knows about. So for example, if something odd is happening, there's a steric inhibition, the protein has a specific binding site that isn't just hydrogen bonding, uh, it will fail. It will not, it may do a reasonable job, but it is certainly not getting at exactly the chemistry. One final comment, uh, and that is, it is very important when you're doing quantum chemistry to have at least one or two real measurements. It is very easy, I tell you from, from experience, it is very easy to get wrong answers. And, because it's, it is a difficult calculation that you've got to get right. So, so you need at least one number of octanol water partition coefficient or something for a chemical that's like it, just to be sure that everything is working okay. Um, so thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Wonderful, thank you, Dom. At this time, I would like to remind the audience to submit your questions using the question and answer box. At the um, on the Zoom screen, if you hover over the Zoom menu. 
Um, we have received um, our first question today from EPA. The question is, given that most explosives are solid at ambient temperatures, does this model or approach inform the prediction of solid to liquid dissolution kinetics for things like RDX or TNT? Um, the Abraham model doesn't do kinetics. It, it, it can be used to make some calculations which might help in, in, uh, in formulating models for kinetics, but it certainly will do the solubility problem. Uh, because in fact, it it knows about it knows about the uh, the molecular configurations, and th there are system parameters for for solubility. It's that that is not a simple problem, by the way, um, because it is not basically a solvent water interaction. Okay, thank you. And can you um, place um, your approach? Um, kind of in the background or, or amongst the variety of quantum chemical methods? How does your me method differ from other no, methods? That's a, that's a good question. The other quant there, are, there are essentially two other methods or two other classes of methods that use quantum chemistry. Uh, the first is a method that uses the, the uh, Cosmo theorem, the, the uh, uh, Andrew Klempt's method, uh, computational technique. And what, what they do is they use moments of the electron distribution and have a regression that that correlates to the to the moments of the of the electron distribution. So they're not focusing on chemical interactions. They're using a regression method. And so if it breaks, you're not sure why it broke. The others, which are the the, the majority of methods, what they normally do is they'll calculate a hundred or so quantum chemical quantum chemically derived molecular properties. And then they will apply regression analysis to the data that they've got, the experimental data that they've got, and then establish a regression model. Again, the problem is you don't know why it picked the parameters that it picked, it just did. And as a consequence, if the thing doesn't work, you don't know where to go next. And the reason we chose the Abraham model is that it is set up in a chemically sensible and interpretable way. It is a very mechanistic or as, as mechanistic as you can get in this kind of a calculation. Uh, and that's the reason for the choice. Okay, great. And we've received a couple of questions about um, um, the failure of the predict predictions. So how do you evaluate prediction failures using the Abraham model? Um, and then, and then, what's the next step if the prediction is is not correct? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, from the history of Abraham parameters that have been estimated for all the solutes that are in the UFZ database, you have a good idea of the range of, for example, hydrogen bond uh, donating and accepting capability, molecular polarizability, and so on. So you can examine what what the uh, what your quantum chemical calculations gave you for those five solute parameters and see if they're, if they're looking strange. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is you can, and I, I, I strongly recommend that if you need these, these uh, parameters for, for a real risk assessment that you invest in at least one or two solvent water measurements. Those are fairly straightforward nowadays. Well, not for PFASs, unfortunately, but at least have one or two data sets that, that where you can check. And if the thing's not working, then you can figure out your normal, by the way, your normal assumption is that there's something went wrong in the quantum chemistry. And usually the problem is conformers. You may not have the molecular structure right. They're, especially in complicated molecules, caged molecules, for example. Uh, there are lots of structures that are close, but if they're off by a kcal or two, that's enough to foul up the partitioning calculations. So you've got a next step, which is what's going into the calculation, namely the computational chemistry part. Are you following the rules that are required? And secondly, are there, are there uh, conformers that you have to worry about where the methyl group has to rotate the other way, that sort of thing? Okay, thank you, Dom. Um, can the Abraham model be be corrected for temperature? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, if you know the enthalpy of the reaction, uh, there is actually, if memory serves, uh, system parameters for an enthalpy correction that 
that has been worked out for certain solvents, but basically it amounts to, do you know the enthalpy of the reaction? It, it cannot calculate enthalpies. You would have to actually, actually look at that directly. Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I do remember that there is, that there are, there is a system parameter or two for, for the enthalpy correction. Okay, great. Um, is your approach um, related to machine learning methods or can machine learning be used um, with the basic approach that you've described? Um, it, is, it is about as far away from machine learning as I can imagine. The way machine learning works is that you have a very large data set, hundreds of observations of partition coefficients, and then it looks for regressions complicated, perhaps nonlinear regressions that relate these hundred or so parameters that you've gotten from quantum chemical calculations or intuited from structure, topological indices, graph, all kinds of stuff. And then it, it, it makes a regression analysis and generates a prediction for the partition. Well, first you have to calibrate it. Um, and you can understand that that is a fairly blind black box kind of a method. You just don't know why it's doing what it's doing. So in the sense that regressions are utilized, yes, both of the methods use regressions. But I point out to you that, that in the Abraham model, the regression only estimates three parameters. And as a consequence, it is a lot less subject to regression difficulties and non-unique regression equations and so on. I'm afraid I'm not a fan of machine learning because if you have a problem you need a solution to, you then generate a machine learning based algorithm. And now, but you don't understand it because it just gives you numbers out of a black box. So you have, you start off with one problem, you don't know the partition coefficient. You now have two problems. You have a model that you don't understand either. So it, it, is, it is, I think the polar opposite, frankly, of machine learning. You can see I have a bias in this subject. <laughs> Understood. Um, the next question has to do with biological transformations. Um, can this approach um, describe biological transformations like TNT to the amino DNTs, or um, can at least can it at least you know um, describe the the potential biological reactions that would be possible? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the short answer is no. The par partitioning calculations are equilibrium calculations. They're essentially thermodynamic equilibrium. It's the same kind of a, an understanding. The, the partition coefficients are linearly related to the formation for the energies of the, of the components. So, so it, it, it's really an equilibrium kind of a calculation. It can tell you what would be the concentration in organism lipid, organism protein. If you have a system parameter for, for an enzyme, for example, it could tell you how strongly it binds to an enzyme. The protein uh, system parameters we have are for albumin. Um, well, you could generate, if and there's an awful lot of data out there, you could generate the partition coefficients to the enzyme that then does the reduction. So the degradation. So yeah, that would be interesting actually, but not, not specifically. I, I, I don't know of any direct attack. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the typical relative error, um, for example, the mean between the calculated and the empirically observed partition coefficients for munitions constituents? Do you have yeah. that? Calculated? Yes, that's a good question. Um, because the, well, in the first place, the root mean square error uh, accounts for both the, the bias and the, and the scatter as well. So it is not a variance. It's, if you think about it, it's the sum of the variance plus the mean squared. Um, and that number typically in a good model is 0.3. In an okay model is about 0.5. And when you start exceeding you know, up to 0.6s or 0.7s, you're beginning to get a fair amount of scatter outside an order of magnitude. Um, you should understand that none of these methods are anywhere as precise as chemical determinations. They are not. And in fact, in the history of quantum chemistry, it was suspected for a long time that it would be of no use to anyone ever. Uh, that fortunately is not the case. And uh, 
but, but it is not a replacement for direct experimental capabilities. Something like you'll certainly get most of the time within an order of magnitude. That's almost guaranteed. And you'll probably get within, you know, three tenths of a log unit in, in fairly well studied and well understood systems. Okay, thank you. Um, Don, we have one final question for you in, in this session. Mm -hmm. um, and that relates to how uh, the members of the audience might be able to use this approach. Um, will there be software of the approach um, or tool available for use at DOD sites? Can you describe how um, practitioners might be able to use this? Yeah. Um, the method that we used in the CERTA project that I've described used a, a salvation model, which is not not readily available. The, the method that we're developing now um, under the current CERTA project uses Gaussian, which is this, the industry standard quantum chemical cal calculator, uh, Gaussian 09 or Gaussian 16 are the standard methods. Um, you can learn to do quantum chemistry on your own. It, it takes some doing. Um, most PhD students can manage the calculations are not difficult in the sense that once you understand what has to be done, you have to make 53 solvent water partition coefficient calculations. After that, it's relatively straightforward and the method, all of the data that we use to generate the, the, the uh, results in the figures I showed you are all part of the CERTA final report. And there are examples that we've, shown in detail so that you can you can check your own methods. Um, and the best thing is to have someone that's a friend of yours that can check your quantum chemistry or to have someone that's actually a professional quantum chemist. There are a number of, of, uh, of such people at in, within DOD um, that, that are you know, state-of-the-art quantum chemists. So it, it is not something where you need a PhD quantum chemist to do the calculations, but you do, if, you, if you're getting some odd results, you certainly need someone to talk to. Okay. Uh, well, Dom, we thank you very much for this presentation and for answering questions. And we will bring Dom back um, at the end of the webinar for a few more questions. Thank you. <clears throat> at this time, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Neil Bruce, the Director and Professor of Biotechnology in the Center for Novel Agricultural Products at the University of York in the United Kingdom. Dr. Bruce's research focuses on plant and microbial metabolism of xenobiotic compounds and the characterization of the enzymes mediating these metabolic processes. He has discovered a diverse range of enzymes that have environmental and biotechnological applications. Dr. Bruce has been studying the chemistry, biochemistry, and molecular genetics of explosive metabolism in plants and microbes for over 20 years. He has co-authored over 150 peer-reviewed papers, many of which focus on explosive biodegradation. He earned his doctoral degree from the University of Kent. Neil, please proceed. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, thank you for the, the introduction. Hello, everyone. So um, I'll just start off by giving you a brief outline of my presentation. So I'll just very briefly touch upon explosives pollution and, and the use of plants to um, uh, remediate um, soil contamination. And I want to tell you a bit about the work we've done in terms of elucidating the mechanism by which TNT is highly toxic to plants. And um, then go on and tell you about some of the work we've done understanding um, plant metabolism of explosives. Specifically today, I'll be talking about TNT. And then I'll touch briefly on some prior work we did quite a while ago now on the microbial degradation of RDX, where we identified uh, a rather novel enzyme, which we call XPLA, that uh, degrades RDX. And then how we've been using the fundamental information that we've gained on plant and microbial metabolism of explosives to engineer robust transgenic plants for the remediation of uh, explosives contamination on military ranges. And then uh, importantly, I want to um, present uh, some of the results that we've got from our field trial with our transgenic grasses um, uh, in terms of remediating or 
removing um, RDX contamination from, contam from, uh, from contaminated soil. Okay, so problem. Um, I think probably the, everyone in the audience is aware that uh, RDX and TNT are toxic and they are highly recalcitrant to degradation. So this means that they can persist for very long periods of time in the environment. And indeed, there are sites sort of dating back to the Second World War that uh, are still contaminated with, with TNT. But what I want to focus on today is the contamination of uh, military ranges, um, which is uh, an intractable challenge because um, the military need to train with, um, with live munitions. And so you've got continual contamination of these sites and uh, you have problem of uh, these contaminants migrating through the soil and then going on to contaminate the groundwater. And the scale of contamination really is um, considerable. So there's a real need to um, develop a technology that could be used on, uh, on ranges to ideally remediate them, but importantly to capture and um, contain those uh, explosives contaminants before they migrate through the soil and contaminate the groundwater, as has been seen at uh, the Massachusetts Military Reservation. So plants, um, in some ways, are ideal for this. Um, they're, they're low maintenance, they're minimally disruptive, they're cost effective, and they're aesthetically pleasing. And they'll take up unnatural compounds and um, they might be able to sequester them within the plant biomass. They may have enzymes that are capable of degrading them. And in some cases, they can um, volatilize the, uh, the, the compounds into the atmosphere. But in terms of using plants to um, remediate explosives pollution or to, um, um, to contain um, explosives contamination on site, there's two um, major inherent problems in terms of using plants. And the first of these is that plants have very limited or actually probably no metabolic activity towards RDX. And this can be seen here in this slide, which um, shows an image of an experiment that uh, Jerry Schnorr's group did, where they um, visualized um, the transport of um, radio labeled RDX and TNT in um, poplar plantlets. And you can see quite clearly here with RDX, that it, um, it goes up through the roots and translocates into the aerial parts of the plant. You can see it throughout the whole plant. Um, and RDX will accumulate to a certain level and then the plant won't take up any more RDX. And um, when the plant dies, the, um, the, the RDX will eventually be returned back to the soil. But if you look at TNT, you can see there's something quite unusual happening here in that the TNT is remaining in the roots. It's sequestered there and it doesn't get up into the aerial parts of the plant. And that's something that puzzled us. We wondered what the plant was doing to, uh, to the TNT to prevent um, translocation into the aerial parts of the plant. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, and so, you know, this posed the question, could we engineer the plants to uh, improve their ability to, um, to take up the explosives, but importantly, to, to break them down? So the other inherent problem is that um, TNT is uh, highly toxic to plants. And um, we wanted to uh, elucidate the mechanism by which TNT exerts its uh, toxicity. And what you can see here is that um, we've got this, these plants growing in uh, soil, uh, the plant is Arabidopsis, um, and the soil contains 100 milligrams of TNT per kilogram of soil. And what you can see is that the plants are incredibly stunted. And um, if there was no TNT in the soil, this is what the um, Arabidopsis plants would look like. But in fact, in, um, here there is in fact TNT, the same concentration of TNT, 100 milligrams of TNT per kilogram of soil. And what we have here is a, a mutant line that we identified. And um, that mutation allows um, the plant to, um, uh, to tolerate uh, um, high levels of TNT. And we mapped that mutation and we identified that um, the mutation was in a gene called MDHR6 that encodes for an enzyme called monodehydroascorbate reductase. And this enzyme is plant specific and it's found in the mitochondria of plants, the power, the, the organelle that generates the power for, 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 for um, eukaryotic cells. 
And um, what happens is that um, TNT diffuses into the mitochondria and it's a substrate for this enzyme. And this enzyme uses a cofactor, NADH, and reduces TNT to a nitro radical. And that radical will react with uh, molecular oxygen to produce reactive oxygen species that um, are cell damaging. And in doing so, the, the TNT is reoxidized back to, sorry, the nitro radical is converted back to TNT. So you end up with this futile cycle. So one molecule of TNT can um, keep on going around this cycle, generating reactive oxygen species. And it's these reactive oxygen species that ultimately kill cells and, uh, and eventually the plant. So knocking out this gene um, confers on the plant resistance to TNT toxicity and um, providing um, the possibility of um, using these plants to, to remediate uh, uh, higher concentrations of TNT in the environment. Um, so I, going back to that um, image of TNT being um, sequestered in the roots, we identified the mechanism by which, the, by which this was happening. So there's an enzyme in plants, uh, a nitroreductase, that reduces the um, nitro group of TNT to a hydroxyl amino um, derivative and then through to an amino derivative. And what that enzyme is doing is adding functionality that's to the TNT molecule that the plant can then recognize. And so what the plant then does, it adds a glucose molecule to, um, to the TNT metabolite. And these um, glucoconjugates can then be locked up in the plant cell wall. So it's removed, removing these um, 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 TNT molecules so that it no longer, so they no longer diffuse into the, um, into the mitochondria. So this fundamental understanding of TNT metabolism allowed us to develop improved TNT remediating lines. And what we did was we um, overexpressed a nitroreductase in plants. Um, and in this case, not the plant's own innate nitroreductase, but a bacterial nitroreductase that has much greater activity towards TNT. So the plant cells now are rapidly converting TNT to the hydroxyl amino dinitrotolerine um, product, which is then getting conjugated to, to sugar um, and then locked up in the plant cell wall. And this works remarkably well. So here you can see, so here you've got the wild type plant that's not transformed or modified in any way. Here you've got the transgenic line, liquid media containing no TNT. You can see the cell, the plants are green, they're healthy. Um, in the presence of 250 micromolar TNT, you can see the wild type plants are now dead, they're chlorotic, they haven't removed any of the TNT from the medium. Whereas the transgenic lines are green, healthy, they've increased in, in biomass, and they've removed all the TNT from the medium. In fact, these plants um, work so well um, that they'll remove basically saturating concentrations of TNT from, from the medium. So, um, so that was uh, really a, an exciting result, um, but we needed to go on and engineer our plants to, um, do, to take up and degrade RDX. So we couldn't find, or we don't know of any plant enzymes that do this. So our, our hypothesis was to um, express in plants a, a bacterial enzyme that could degrade RDX. And um, we'd gone out and done sort of classic selective enrichments in the past where we'd isolated bacteria from RDX contaminated soil that could utilize RDX as um, as a nitrogen source for growth. So you can see these bacteria going on this agar plate here um, um, using, using RDX as a nitrogen source for growth. And in these bacteria, we identified the enzyme that was mediating this degradation of RDX, um, and we called this uh, enzyme XPLA. And um, XPLA is rather a novel enzyme. In fact, it's a, a, a cytochrome P450 and it's novel because unlike most cytochrome P450s, it doesn't use molecular oxygen in its reaction mechanism. So this enzyme, what it does, it reductively clips off nitro groups off the RDX molecule. So here you can see the enzymes remove two nitro groups off RDX. It then goes on to, fo um, it, that forms this unstable intermediate, basically falls apart to generate 
these uh, non-toxic metabolites, NDA is a butanol, NDAB, um, two equivalents of nitrite and an equivalent of formaldehyde. And it's the nitrite that the bacteria are using as their, as their sole nitrogen source for growth. So our strategy in terms of uh, engineering um, plants for the phytoremediation of RDX is quite straightforward. The idea being is that we'd express XPLA and its partner reductase um, XPLB in uh, implants, along with this bacterial nitroreductase that um, reduces TNT to the hydroxyl amino dinitrotolerin derivative, which then gets conjugated to sugars and the TNT gets locked up in, in the biomass. So with RDX, the, um, it would get broken down to metabolites that the plant can actually utilize, um, whereas with TNT, these conjugates would be um, locked away in the plant cell wall. So what you can see here are, are um, Arabidopsis plants in liquid medium. And um, the liquid medium contains TNT and RDX. And in the first flask, we have a, a natural wild type plants. In the second flask, we have transgenic lines expressing XPLA and its partner reductase XPLB. In the third flask, we've got um, plants expressing the bacterial nitroreductase. And in the final flask, we've got the plants expressing all those genes, XPLA, XPLB, and the nitroreductase. So you can clearly see that the wild type plants are dead. Um, and if you look at the graph, you can see that they've hardly removed any of the TNT and none of the RDX. And the same is true for the XPLA lines. Um, the plants have been killed for, due to the TNT toxicity. Whereas with the nitroreductase lines, you can see that within, um, in blue here, in a matter of two days, it's removed all of the um, TNT from the medium, but it's unable to remove any of the RDX. Whereas with the um, multiple transgenic line, you can see that like the single nitroreductase line, the, the, the plant lines are able to remove the TNT within a couple of days. Uh, and then the plants are able to then degrade all the RDX from the liquid medium. So, um, so this was an important finding and, and an exciting result. And this then spurred us to go on and engineer plants that um, would be more appropriate for use um, in the field uh, because Arabidopsis is a model plant. It's too small. It's completely inappropriate for phytoremediation applications. So um, uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the University of Washington, we went on to engineer um, transgenic switchgrass. And um, the reason why we chose switchgrass is that switchgrass is uh, uh, native to many US military ranges. Uh, it produces a, a large amount of biomass. Um, the roots will penetrate quite significant depths, up to about a meter into, in the soil, and um, have very dense root systems. So those root systems cover a large surface area. Um, and um, so uh, the, other, the other important factor is that um, for choosing switchgrass is that due to the bioenergy programs, there are now um, good genetic tools for um, genetically modifying switchgrass. So much as we did with Arabidopsis, we expressed our um, two enzymes or three enzymes in there, XPLA and XPLB and the nitroreductase. But for now, I'm just going to focus on the results that we've got for, for RDX. So we tested our transgenic lines out as we did before in liquid medium. And you see in the no plant control, there's um, um, very little RDX being removed from that medium over time. The wild type plants are removing RDX from the medium. And this is because the, the switchgrass has got quite a large amount of biomass and it's taken up RDX into that biomass. Um, and that's why you're seeing the removal here of RDX from the liquid medium. But you can clearly see that the, uh, the transgenic lines are um, much more rapidly removing the RDX, but importantly, they're degrading it. And that's what you can see in the second graph, um, that the independent transgenic lines, when you assay the, um, the, the, the plant tissue, you cannot detect any RDX, whereas you've got significantly, um, significant quantities of RDX being measured for the wild type lines. And that mirrors that auto radiograph that I showed early on, um, where you've seen RDX being 
um, translocated throughout the whole plant and remaining there. So we then needed to go on and do um, soil studies. So um, these are um, soil microcosm studies. So this, these are experiments where we're um, wanting to mimic effectively what will happen on, on a military range where you've got particulates of RDX that would be dissolved and um, migrate into the soil. So we watered in um, RDX into the microcosm, um, left it there for a period of time, and then we flushed through the remaining RDX and measured it in the, in the leachate. So uh, what you can see here is that um, we could measure RDX in the leachate from the wild type plants. So this is getting washed through the, the microcosm, whereas with the transgenic lines, we were seeing uh, absolutely no detectable RDX coming through in the leachate. So the plants had taken up and removed and degraded the, the RDX, preventing it migrating any further through the soil. And uh, again, mirroring what we see in the liquid cultures, we see no or very little RDX being detected in the, in the leaf tissues. So this was a fantastic result. And um, you know, we've done these trials in the lab and in glasshouse um, studies, but really to demonstrate the efficacy of these plants, we needed to test them in the field. Uh, and so we we're very fortunate to be able to do field trials at, um, at Fort Drum in, uh, in New York State. And uh, the next, oh, so before we could do the trials, we needed to get a permit from USDA and APHIS to enable the controlled release of these transgenic plants into the environment. And as, far, as part of that permitting process, we needed to collect um, some data. We needed to um, log the rainfall amounts on the plots. We needed to um, provide GPS coordinates uh, of the site. We need to make sure that there was only controlled uh, access to the site and we needed to uh, survey the soil flora and, and fauna um, at Fort Drum around the, um, the test site. And as a specific condition, we needed to remove the developing flower heads from the plants to prevent um, cross pollination with other grasses uh, at Fort Drum. So here you can see some images in terms of the construction of our, of our field plots. Um, the site layout was based on a completely randomized design. We had three soil treatments, three vegetation treatments, and these were replicated three times, um, resulting in a total of 27 plots, which you can see um, from this aerial photograph of the site at Fort Drum. The plots are, um, uh, were three meters by, by three meters. And this next slide shows you a cross section of, uh, of the plot. So the plot was about a half a meter deep. We used soil from Fort Drum to fill the plots. Um, and we uh, contaminated the, the, the plots with RDX by mixing RDX with fine sand and, um, and putting that on the surface of the plots to a concentration of about 100 parts per million, which is around the concentration you find around a low order detonation. Then in these plots, we had lysimeters so that we could take soil water samples and um, measure the RDX concentration in the soil water over periods of time. We had a culvert in there with, uh, with a pump so that um, in cases of heavy rainfall, um, we could pump out excess water into a holding tank we also had an irrigation system, so if the plots needed watering, we could water them from the, the um, water in the, in the holding tank. And um, we would sample these through the growing season. We'd take um, um, samples from the lysimeters and from the, um, um, from the plant um, leaf tissue. So this slide shows the appearance of the plots um, each year. So we got our permit in the summer of 2016. So we were able to get our plants into the ground, which was a real champagne moment for us. Uh, and um, then we had, uh, well, so, so it was late summer, so we weren't able to um, get the plants established enough to take any samples. But in 2016 and 2017, we had a terrible winter in New York State. Um, followed by um, one of the wettest summers ever in 2017, which meant the plants um, took a while to get established. 
And it wasn't really until 2018 that we were able to uh, start taking samples from these plots. And you can see quite clearly, I um, mean, 2018, the plants uh, had a really sort of dense coverage in the plots, good canopy coverage. Um, and what you can see here are representatives of um, uh, uh, unmodified plants growing in a plot with no RDX. This is the uh, transgenic lines growing in a plot without RDX. Here you can see the wild type plants growing on the plots in the presence of 100 parts per million of RDX. And here's the, the transgenic line. So in terms of physiology departures, looking at them, there is um, no significant differences uh, in terms of the amount of growth that we're getting on these, on these plots. So in 2018, in the growing season, we took monthly samples where we'd take um, uh, leaf material uh, and analyze them for RDX content and take soil water samples from, um, from the lysimeters and, um, and determine the RDX concentration. We've got huge amounts of data which we've collected over this period and done a whole, a whole series of different types of analysis on it, which is not time to tell you about today, um, but these are um, presented in the, uh, the report on the ESTCP ASERDIC um, website. But I will just show you two slides that summarize um, our findings from our field trials. So um, this slide shows the mean RDX concentrations in plant tissues from the 100 part per million plots over the 2008 growing season. And um, we were delighted to find that they mirrored the results that we had in the, in the glass house, um, the greenhouse studies and lab studies really very well, in that we were seeing significant amounts of RDX accumulating in the plant tissue in the wild type plants, um, and absolutely no RDX could be detected in the, in the transgenic lines. So we then um, went on to calculate the amount of RDX that was removed from the plots. And we were able to do this um, um, by um, the fact that we know the amount of rainfall that um, um, landed on the, on the plots over the year. We know the amount of water that was pumped out and we know the concentration of RDX uh, in the water from um, the, um, the lysimeter um, and from the analysis of the samples taken out from the, from the lysimeters. And the, uh, the transgenic plants removed um, about six times more RDX from the plots than the wild type plants. And uh, this equates to um, something like 27 kilograms of RDX per hectare, which I think is really quite remarkable considering um, these are, are unoptimized systems. And you know, we were getting removal from the soil by the, by the wild type plants. Um, but you need to remember, of course, that our RDX in those wild type plants is not being degraded. So when the plant dies, um, that RDX is being returned back to the soil. And, you know, it's a, you know so any plants on a contaminated site is therefore likely to um, accumulate RDX in the, uh, in the aerial parts of the plant. And so the RDX there will be, av will be available to herbivores um, grazing on, on any of these plants on, um, on contaminated sites. So, so in, in summary, we've developed um, robust transgenic plants that can um, remove RDX and TNT um, from soil, potentially preventing leaching into groundwater. We've demonstrated this um, for both TNT and RDX in greenhouse studies. We were then um, granted uh, a, a permit for field trials for our RDX degrading plants, and we've demonstrated that this can be successfully translated. Um, to a uh, military site. In terms of benefits to DOD, so um, these plants are, uh, have the potential for self-sustaining, inexpensive and environmentally friendly ways of, uh, of, of, of range restoration that can potentially be used over large areas of land to prevent groundwater contamination. Importantly, they will allow the land to remain in use with uh, limited closure to military activities and um, a wide range of specific areas that can benefit include firing points, impact areas, manufacturing sites, and, and demolition areas. I would just like to finish by um, acknowledging my 
um, colleagues and partners on this project. So uh, Liz Rylett, who works with me here at the University of York, uh, Stuart Strand and uh, Long Zhang at the University of Washington, and Tim Carey and Tony Palazzo at Erdic Krell. And, uh, and finally, just thank you. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is some more detailed information on the results of our field trials um, on the CERDIC STCP website. Thank you. Great, thank you, Neil. The first question is how deep can the root system go to uptake and then remove RDX and or TNT? So with, with the switchgrass, they can um, um, grow to a depth of about a meter into the soil. Okay, great, thank you. And how long do you think that the degradation with the switchgrass can persist? Um, so, uh, so as long as the plants are alive, they will have that capability to degrade RDX because the, the gene is being expressed along with other constituents being expressed in the plants. So the plant is continuously making the enzymes that, um, that degrade RDX. Okay, excellent. This question is from the Hawaii Department of Health. In the field experiments, were multiple lysimeters placed in some plots to look at the variability of RDX in soil moisture? Um, yes, yes, we, we did have um, multiple lysimeters in there. Um, we did see differences um, in the movement of RDX through that soil, um, which perhaps wasn't surprising um, because obviously the, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, it, it's not a completely homogeneous system. So, um, so we were taking multiple samples and, and then taking the average from them. Okay. And how do, are the plants affected by um, chunk explosives from low order detonations? Did you consider pieces of the explosives? Yeah, so, um, so they're not, not affected. So obviously they can only take up RDX when it's in solution. So, um, uh, so, so when, it's, if, when it's in a particulate form, it has no effect upon the plant. Um, same with TNT. Um, it's only when it gets um, dissolved that um, it starts impacting on the plant in terms of toxicity, but also in terms of being taken up and degraded and, and sequestered. So, um, so that's what we were trying to mimic in these plots where we're using particulate RDX mixed in with sand so we've got hopefully a, a fairly homogeneous coverage on the surface of the soil and then when it rains that RDX is then being dissolved and um, uh, it's then migrating through the soil and then being taken up by the, the roots of the plants. And since the root system is, is limited to the top meter or so, um, in that situation, can the explosive migrate below that horizon depth? So it will really depend on the amount of vegetation on the site. So, um, so obviously the Arctic is going to come into contact with the root systems. Um, so uh, as we found in our soil lysimeter studies, we, you know, there we didn't see any migration beyond the root depth of those plants. Out in the field, you know, you're not going to have that same amount of, um, uh, of coverage of biomass. So uh, whether you could capture it all, um, we don't know yet. You know, one of the next stages will be to, um, to carry out trials in um, plots that are not lined. Um, so uh, that would be, uh, you know, a, a further stage ahead, really, in terms of where we need to go in terms of the evaluation of these plants. So those trial, I, I forgot to mention that those plots were, were lined, so, um, so the RDX couldn't escape from those plots. Ah, thank you. And this uh, question is from the US Army Chemical Biological Center. Have you looked at different uptake rates relative to soil types or properties? Um, no, that's a, a really good question. And um, it's not something we've we've compared. So in, um, in Fort Drum, it's a very sandy soil. So, you know, RDX will mi migrate through quite quickly. Those soil microcosm studies that I showed were done in a sandy soil. Um, 
Here at York, we've also done some work with um, sort of compost rich soils. With RDX, you don't get so much interaction between the organic components in the soil, but TNT, that will make a big difference. So TNT will bind quite tightly to organic material and clays, which will <laughs> limit the speed at which it migrates. Um, so, so it's an important question and not something we've, we've fully evaluated yet. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, one last question for you and then we will bring um, Dom back for questions for both of you. Um, do, do you think that the um, enzyme XPLA could be used to treat RDX in a groundwater plume somehow? Um, it's a nice idea if uh, part of the problem of using the purified enzyme is um, is one its stability and uh, and secondly you need to requ it requires a cofactor for activity and um, that would just make it too prohibitively expensive to um, to ever use the free enzyme alone okay thank you Neil all right and we have Dom um, back on the line um, Don, we received a few questions from the audience um, about the applicability of the quantum chemistry approach to other types of contaminants. So specifically, can it be applied to metals and organometal compounds like methylmercury? Um, and then I think you had also mentioned PFAS a couple of times. Yeah, um, well, metals. Um, the problem is that the electrostatic uh, energies involved in ionizing chemicals make the the current formulation of the Abraham model in, inapplicable. I mean, if you had a neutral, uh, for example, a methylmercury, you know, dimethylmercury, for example, um, it's possible calculating solvation for organometallics. I don't know if it's ever been tried, but but certainly there's a fair amount of data. So that that would be an interesting exercise. Um, the mercury as a molecule, as an atom in a calculation could could be difficult, it's rather large, but there has been experience doing those sorts of organometallic calculations. So I, I think it's possible. The problem with ionized chemicals, specifically anions and fluorinated material, is that the quantum chemical solvation models don't work very well at all uh, for anions in their current state of applicability. Um, you need to, and the reason is that they are, is that the, well, first you have to calculate solvent water partition coefficients for anions. You can do it, the calculations will, will produce numbers, but then you have to deal with the regression and it is not clear that the numbers are good enough to be solved by the multiple, um, the multiple 53 data points approach. So overwhelm the errors with a lot of data. It's sort of a standard statistical way to attack it. We are working on some methods which both improve the solvation calculation and also um, make a direct estimate of the hydrogen bonding and hydrogen accepting capability of the of PFASs. Um, it's simplified because they have a, the, the donation and accepting group is, is in the, at, at the carboxylic end, uh, head of the thing. Of the molecule, so so it looks like it might work, um, but right now it, it's pretty difficult. I should also tell you that Abraham and Acree have published a method that generalizes the the, the model and adds an additional term, J terms, lowercase and uppercase J terms, to deal with the electrostatic anionic contributions and cationic contribution. The problem is that you haven't got system parameters for the J's, and so you can't use all of the system work that's been done over the last 40 years. And as a consequence, it's not terribly practical. So the methods we're attempting to use, which are showing some promise, I might say, um, utilize currently available system parameters and calculate the normal five solute parameters, but using better and um, better adapted methods for, for charged compounds. And also the fluorinated piece, by the way, fluorine atoms are also something of a problem from quantum chemistry, although that's pretty well understood nowadays. Okay, thank you very much, Dom. Neil, there's a similar question to you. Do you think that this plant system or, or others could be applicable to other explosives compositions in the future? 
Uh, absolutely. And um, of course, TNT and RDX are looking to be replaced with, um, with insensitive munitions. And uh, so, for example, DNAN, dinitroanosol, was shown has the same mechanism of toxicity as, as TNT. Um, and the enzymes that um, are active against TNT that detoxify it have no effect on DNAN. So that gets up into the aerial parts of the plant. So that's going to be more challenging, I think, to resolve. Uh, and likewise, NTO is much more polar than RDX and migrates very quickly through the soil. And like RDX, the plant has no activity towards it. So I think, with, again, with both types of explosives, we're going to need to take a, um, you know, a, a GM approach in terms of um, uh, engineering plants to be able to tackle them. Um, but yes, absolutely. And, and there are many examples now of, uh, of, of other organic pollutants that can be um, um, remediated uh, using this type of technology. Thank you. Um, Neil, we also have a follow-up clarification um, question from earlier. Um, detonations can result in um, cratering um, in the impact areas. Um, have you considered whether grass cover could be maintained in, an, in a cratered area? Um, no, no, we haven't. But of course, agronomy of these sites is, um, is an important um, um, part of maintaining these these sites. So uh, uh, yes, if, <laughs> if, if there's uh, you know, a huge explosion, you'll, you'll remove all, all the plants that are there. Uh, but it's in a case of hoping that you can replant those, those particular sites. Um, but I, you know, I think there's, yeah, clearly, clearly if you've got a, a six foot crater, um, then uh, it's going to be challenging for any plants to survive that sort of detonation. Sure. <clears throat> Well, this time I would like to thank both of our speakers very much for the very um, excellent presentations and for answering so many questions. And our next webinar in the series is on Thursday, May 20th, and it will present DoD funded research efforts to improve and enhance microgrid solutions on military installations. Registration is open now, so please visit the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar webpage to register both for this next webinar and other future webinars. Before we wrap up, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on the webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. And this concludes today's webcast. Thank you.